talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real Woo! fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Real Fans Real Talk. We hope all of you are staying safe during this quarantine craziness in New York. I'm your host, Emma Marie, and of course, I have my two guys with me, Trip Young and the amazing Legend in Two Games. What's going on, guys? What's up, what's up, what's up? Another quarantine edition of uh, Real Fans Real Talk, and I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so Eric, you already know, we know you're keeping track of how many days we have without sports. We talked about the sports that came back, but overall, we're missing, you know, the NBA, the NFL. Tell us how, what's going on. So, yes, technically today is day 74 without NBA. Uh, mm -hmm. I can no longer say day 74 without sports, though, because right. uh, we've gotten some golf back. And today, Tom Brady... Peyton Manning, uh, Tiger Woods, and Phil Mickelson are all competing in a charity golf event down in Miami. Um, we, we know we got UFC back. Um, there's some soccer leagues that are back. So we're slowly getting back into the normal news cycle. Um, mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, um, you know, we've been keeping track. It's day 74 without the NBA. However, there was some developing news this week that the NBA is seriously discussing returning at the end of July. Um, where they would uh, have a centralized location. They would be using the Disney facility uh, down in Orlando. They would have all the playoff teams located there. Um, right now, the NBA is trying to figure out if they can, if they would just use one facility, if they would need to use two facilities, if we're going to go straight into the playoffs or possibly extend the regular season. Uh, there's been some good news coming out of our hometown as um, Governor Cuomo came out and said that, um, you know, New York teams can now go back to their practice facilities and using their mm -hmm. facilities as well. So. It looks like we're starting to trend in the right direction. Yes, it's all great news. We know we're still missing the sports that, you know, we love talking about the most. But uh, Tripp, if you want to give us a rundown on what's going on as well. Yeah, um, you know, but first of all, I'm, I'm totally excited about that. I, I hope everything gets back on track because, you know, my man King James is coming for his. So I need, I need things to get back to normal. Um, but, you know, LeBron was also – it's crazy because I feel like during this whole quarantine, I've heard more LeBron talk than I did before, yeah, before everything was shut down. Like, it's like everything that goes on in the world somehow comes back to LeBron James, which I don't understand. But Because uh, he's King James. What you mean you don't understand it? Yeah, well, it's kind of, it's a little bit, it's a little bit crazy. Everybody got the King <laughs> name in their mouth, one of which being uh, one of the guys, he's probably number two. As far as players that I didn't like um, growing up watching basketball, and that's uh, Paul Pierce, who might be LeBron's arch nemesis. He puts out his uh, his top five list, and uh, he leaves LeBron James off of his top five list. Mm -hmm. um, now we know, you know, that it's a little bit it's a little bit petty when it comes to Paul Pierce. He has a little extra grudge with LeBron James. They've always had a uh, heated back and forth type of relationship. Um, but after he put out his list, uh, Kendrick Perkins, who was a teammate of uh, Paul Pierce for a couple of years in Celtics, was on that championship team uh, with uh, Garnett, Ray Allen, and uh, Rondo, and, uh, and 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 Paul Pierce. And uh, he told us a story. Well, he didn't tell us, but he you know he told a story of LeBron's rookie year. Uh, they were playing a preseason game in Ohio, and uh, it was getting heated. They were going back and forth. But uh, so, you know, towards the end of the game, Paul Pierce actually spits at uh, LeBron James in the, the Cavaliers bench, which is over the top crazy to me. Like, there's no 
no, no, no way, shape, or form that you should be spitting at anybody. Like, that's the utmost disrespect. Um, you know, I always knew Paul Pitts was a hater, you know, prior to, you know, um, you know, him putting, the, leaving him off his top five list. But just hearing the fact that he actually spit at the Cavs bench. And then, you know, when he's talking about it, he's not even, you know, apologetic about the situation. He's kind of like, yeah, it happened. It is what it is type of thing, which, which I thought was even crazier. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm good. No, hearing that story, it's just, I don't know. I, I'm all about character and just the fact that he spits at, like, that's just so disrespectful. So I don't know how that wasn't even a bigger story when it happened. Um, but it's just, that's just insane. It's like massively disrespectful on Pierce's part. And that whole Celtics error, I, I think I've said it before on air, where I feel like that Boston Celtics team, that 2008 through 2012, right? That was kind of their run right there because when, once LeBron went to Miami, their run was over. So from like 2008 to 2012, 2013, that Celtics team, they carried themselves with a certain aura as if they were like this legendary NBA team. You know, yeah. they won one championship. And I thought it was, I thought it was just really, it was, it was clownish of, of Paul Pierce to be like, oh, LeBron isn't a top five player. Like anyone who's watched enough basketball will tell you LeBron James is mentioned amongst the greatest to ever play the game. Um, whether you want to call it the Mount Rushmore, the top five, the GOAT list, whatever you want to call it, if you're not mentioning LeBron James within that top four to five players that ever played a game, you, you have not been watching basketball. Simple as that. Um, but then, you know, the, the pettiness, Paul Pierce has always had this chip on his shoulder when it comes to LeBron James, and I don't know if he feels like he never got his proper due because of LeBron being in the league, but he's always had this little back and forth for LeBron, and he just, he, to me, he comes out of it looking like a fool. You know, you don't put him on your top five list. Then we find out that you spit in the direction of the man during his rookie season. I, I, I don't really understand that on Paul's part. And um, I'm glad Kendrick told that story because, you know, Kendrick could have easily held on to that, especially knowing that he was a teammate of Paul Pierce. But he wanted to be honest about why he felt Paul Pierce would have left him off the list. And even in that clip that you mentioned, Trip, they show where, where, Pier I mean, where Perkins talks about this longstanding beef between them. This season, when the, when the games were still being played, there's a clip of LeBron walking up to Kendrick Perkins, giving him a hug, shaking his hand, and then completely walking right past Paul Pierce. He didn't even want to acknowledge Paul Pierce. And we're talking about 17 years later, he still won't speak to him or at least give him the recognition that, hey, we're in the same room. There's nothing to talk about. Yeah. And, cause, and I, I mean, that's real corny of Paul Pierce. Like, because uh, like, we know as men, there's a couple of things that, you know, that level of disrespect like somebody are gonna really put hands on you behind. One of them things is you inviting another man in your private. You know the other man, other one of them is is spitting, you know, on somebody or, or at somebody. Like you got you got to be prepared to throw hands. And you know, Perk even said, you know, a little scuffle ensued after that in the locker room. Like it got real ugly, you know. And for me, it's just magnified because I already kind of looked at you know Paul Pierce kind of as an asshole after that whole thing in the garden, you know, beating the Knicks in a regular season game, and you start bowing and running laps around the garden. I'm like, bro, like Jordan didn't even do that. And he and he demoralized the Knicks. You know what I'm saying? And he wasn't on it like that. So for you to be doing something like that, and you're not even of that, that caliber, so I just thought it was the utmost disrespect. And that's with me, you know, I always got something, something negative to say about the Knicks, but in that moment, it was like, hold on now, you're not about to disrespect the New York. You know what I'm saying? Like it's still, we might joke amongst each other, you know what I'm saying? It'd be like, you know, with your, with your siblings, something like that. We might get at each other, but ain't nobody coming from the outside world and going to disrespect this, and we just going to sit back and be like, it's cool. So from that moment, I had stopped rocking with Paul, with Paul Pierce. You know, he's, all, he's been saying outlandish stuff in the media mm -hmm. for like the past two years, though. He had, you know, he's better than Wade. Now Braun isn't in, his, in, in the top five. And it was the dumbest reason for LeBron not even being in the top five at that. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. I think that this situation is just one of the additional nonsense activities or things that, you know, he has said, and it's just going to speak to his legacy and it's going to hurt what we know of him. So, so you know, I, we always talk about character and a lot of these players, what they do doesn't just end on the court. It's outside. That's why people salute, you know, 
saluted Kobe so much and LeBron James because their legacies transcend past the court. So this is just going to affect him in a negative way. So he's just really making himself look really silly. Yeah, at least if he was apologetic about it, I might have been like, all right, you know what? It was it was in the heat of the moment. It shouldn't happen. He understands that. But he really was just coming off like, I don't care. Yeah, I did it. So what? I don't rock with him. I don't care. Like Yeah, that's that what I mean. They A lot of those guys, um, and I don't get it. Again, they carry themselves. Like, that's the same group of guys, that Boston team, that got upset with Ray Allen for going to Miami at the end of their run. And they held this grudge against Ray Allen. And like I said, they carry themselves with, like, this this royalty-type, you know, like, oh, we're so much better than everything else that was going on. Like, they tried to knock LeBron for the Miami thing. And I've heard Kevin Garnett go on and on about, oh, LeBron had to go over there because he couldn't beat us. Like, bro, I'll be the first to say I'm not a fan of LeBron going to Miami. But you cannot say to me that he had to go over there to beat you when y'all loaded up to beat him. You know what I'm saying? Kevin Garnett had never been to a finals before Boston. Paul Pierce never been to a finals. Rondo had never been to a finals. LeBron had already been to a finals when those guys got together. LeBron was, was just scratching the surface of what we're seeing now. So you guys joining up, you guys had to do that in order to beat him because Paul, Pier Paul Pierce on his own couldn't do it. Ray Allen in Seattle couldn't get to a finals. Kevin Garnett had only gotten out of the first round one time in Minnesota. So you guys had to come together for the greater good of, oh, if we want to win a championship, this might be our best shot. And that's what happened. But they go on and on about LeBron and they go on and on about everything else they don't like in the league. But I never hear them openly admit, like, we weren't as great as we thought. We won one championship. That was it. We won one. And, then, and the next time we faced Kobe, Kobe got us up out of there. So, you know, you got to give LeBron his respect to um, and, and as you mentioned, Tripp, uh, Pierce's comments about Wade is, is ridiculous. We know Wade was a better player than Paul Pierce was. It's, right. You don't even got to debate it. Um, I remember last year in the playoffs, uh, you know, Kyrie had a really good game, one against Milwaukee, and he was already anointing, oh, Boston's going to beat Milwaukee. And then Antetokounmpo got them right up out of there, too. So he continues to say outlandish things that just make him look stupider and stupider every time he tries to sound knowledgeable about what's going on now that he's not playing the game. Right. And you know what? That's just that's such a classic, like, old varsity, you know, dude in the neighborhood talking about back in the day, like, bring that energy when it was the time. Don't talk about wish it could have, would have, or talk about people in that way. And even, you know, the, the fact that people criticize LeBron so much for that trade, I wanted to circle back on that. We all know in this league, like, you do what you need to do to get a ring. And I never understood that backlash. I know we have people like, you know, um, like Kobe, who stayed on the same team forever and got consistent rings. And that's amazing, you know, to have that rapport. But I still think it shouldn't matter any less that you were able to use your brain and create a team that was powerful enough to win. I, I don't think that should be frowned upon. I think it was smart basketball. It's strategic. I guess uh, and it's good coaching. You know what I mean? What? I said, I guess he figured since the guys came to him, he didn't do it. They did it. They they right. joined him. He stayed. He stayed in, in Boston. Right, yeah, but I mean, he, he, he was ring chasing towards the end. Yeah, I, I mean, listen. No matter how you want to argue it, you can make the case either way. You know, whether you like his decision to go to Miami, or if you felt he should have stayed in Cleveland, or if you felt they should have joined up in another team. However, you want to make the argument, you can make the argument. But bottom line, um, me as somebody who loves the game and has watched the game for so long, the year that the Celtics won the championship in '08. LeBron took them to seven games by himself. When they had three All-Stars, three future Hall of Famers, and Rondo was still very young and Perkins, LeBron James was dropping 35 and 40 points consistently on them guys and got them and, and dragged the Cleveland team to game seven against the eventual champion. So that, that's what I, I like the least about all these comments. Like, they talk about LeBron as if they were just smacking LeBron upside the head and then he had to go to Miami. LeBron was competing. He just didn't have the pieces with him to be able to get over that hump. But when he went to Miami that first year, they beat Boston in five games. That second year, they went seven games. And to me, I always credit it as one of LeBron's best performances because they were down 3-2 going back to Boston, and LeBron dropped 45 points in a game that Miami had to win to save their season. So you cannot – I don't care what your personal beefs were. I don't care if you felt, oh, this guy might have been overrated. You got to tip your hat to the guy and say, look, we had some great battles in the playoffs. And the same way we gave it to him, he gave it to us. 
We got to him early on because we had the pieces, but when he had the pieces, he got to us. And that's how it happens. And as Tripp mentioned, when Pearson and Garnett, they were old, they went to Brooklyn. They thought they were going to be able to hang with Miami then, and they couldn't hang with Miami. And he kind of, they kind of did the same thing. They wanted to chase a ring and hope to steal a ring late in their career, and it didn't work. But you got to give your credit to LeBron James. He is, without a doubt, one of the top five players of all time. You might have him higher than other people, but he's in that conversation. Okay. Now, speaking of other trades, um, so Bradley Bill trade offers are swirling around the Washington Wizards again. Um, but the league and kind of sources aren't sure if anyone's going to be offering enough for the league's second um, leading scorer. So, I mean, there's talks of the Nets. Um, but what do you guys what do you guys think about this? That that even that option. Uh, what do you mean? You said you said I got the Nets out already, so I, I don't mind having a big three in uh, in Brooklyn. I mean, obviously, you know, Kevin Durant, you know, it's, he, I mean, he you could argue he's the best player in basketball right now, but he still has to come back on the court and play. Uh, you know, Kyrie, I think he'll be fine coming into next season. But you know, it's always good to have another superstar in the building who who usually stays healthy. But for me, I, honestly, I'd rather them uh, go after Gobert, because I know they were talking about that as well. And it's probably going to take the same trade pieces to uh, to land a Bradley Bill that it would to to land Rudy Gobert. It'll probably be a combination of uh, uh, Spencer Dimwitty. You know, that's my guy, Eric, but he'd have to go on the deal. Uh, probably Kyrie Levert uh, and maybe Jared Allen as well. So for me, I'd rather, if, if I'm going to make that trade, I think they still have enough offensive uh, firepower between Kyrie and, um, you know, and Kevin Durant. Plus, they got a couple other pieces because I'm sure that um, they'll, they'll get a couple of guys to sign back for cheap if, that, if they're able to do that. But I think that if you can add a Rudy Gobert and have a, a, probably the best defensive big man in basketball right now as the anchor, and then you got, you know, with, with Durant, and Kyrie out there, we still got DeAndre Jordan to come off the bench, so you don't lose much um, if you do have to get rid of Jared Allen, who I like a lot. You know, what I'm saying as, as a as a, as a young uh, big man, I think he's he's still got a lot more to prove, but I think he's been doing well the past uh, his first couple of years in the league. Um, so I would rather that trade, but again, I'm not gonna turn down Bradley Bill as a superstar in his own right. So if you can get Bradley Bill and, and have a big three, I'm all for it. Because either way, I think you know they have a, a good chance to, to make it to the finals um, as good as any in, in the, the, the Eastern Conference. And, and we, got, we, got, we got a guest. You want to you intro our guest? Yes. So we have a special guest coming on today. Um, I'm a great friend of his wife. Um, his name is Devrin Paul, a.k.a. Coach DP. Um, he has been such an influence in not only the basketball space, but for women athletes as well. So Definitely excited to have him on the show today, and we are going to have him come on now. Happy to be here. What's up, everybody? Man, what's good? Man, happy to be on. Thanks for having me. Thank Absolutely. you so much Absolutely. for being Absolutely. a part. His energy is fire. Well, like, <laughs> why not? Why not? You know what I'm saying? The sun is out. I'm in New York, baby. What, what could be better? <laughs> Time to turn for up. Sure. So um, just to kind of introduce you guys, so you know, I kind of, I was bragging about you earlier and I was speaking about just knowing, um, definitely growing up with your wife. Um, so this is, you know, Tripp and Eric, and we definitely are so thankful to have you today. Um, if you want to give our audience just a quick bio about yourself, um, and then we'll get into to more questions. Oh, definitely. No doubt. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm thankful uh, to be on the show. Uh, to be able to be a guest. I'm thankful to even be alive at this point where everything yeah. is going on. Uh, so I'm just thankful um, to be here today. Uh, but overall, so I started out as a basketball manager. Uh, I started my career at Kentucky State University on the D2 side. Always played ball in high school. Uh, I actually got cut in the seventh grade. I got cut in the seventh grade, and then I realized that I need to work on my game. Uh, so my uncle, he took me under his wing. He's always been a coach, always been around basketball. So he kind of raised me in a basketball sense. Uh, so he, he took me under his wing. I made the team, got better, uh, kept developing as a player. Next thing you know, coaching just kind of called me. I went to college at Kentucky State University, a small D2 school in Kentucky. 
HBCU. So I had a good time. I had a good time in school. <laughs> Great time. Uh, so my uncle helped me to get on with coaching. I became a, a student manager. I started working out my own friends, really got into play of development, took that to the next step. Uh, next thing you know, I, I got offered a graduate assistant job at the University of Louisville. So I switched from the men's side to the women's side at that point. Uh, went to the U University of Louisville to work for Jeff Walls. Uh, I was there for uh, two years as a GA. We went to a national championship my first year, so got a chance to experience that. Um, after that, I got bumped up to a video coordinator. Um, really not even from uh, trying to get the job, just from being around the program, being loyal and faithful. Uh, next thing you know, I got promoted uh, to a special assistant to the head coach. Uh, we went to another national championship game, lost that one, but uh, it was another Final Four under our belt. Uh, went from there to go be an assistant coach at Marshall University, uh, helped turn around that program. I worked with a, a head coach by the name of Matt Daniel. He's now the, the head coach at Arkansas State. Uh, so we turned that program around. When we first got there, they had won nine games. When we left, they had won 22 games. We went to postseason play for the first time in 25 years while we were there. Uh, then I just got the itch to be with my wife. <laughs> uh, so we was dating long distance at the time. We had been dating for two years. Um, and we kind of sat down and we talked about what we want our life to look like and what we want to do together. And we always wanted to be business owners. So we started our own basketball training business in Long Island. Uh, one thing led to another. So I just picked up and left coaching. Uh, I actually got offered a job um, at Albany I was interviewing for that job and I kind of sat down and I thought about, is this really what I want to do with my next step in my career? Uh, so I started talking to my girlfriend, who's my wife now, uh, and we just kind of, we, we figured, you know what, if we're going to take a chance, let's take a chance on ourselves. Uh, so we started our basketball training business. One thing led to another. And I could really just say my wife really built the business because I just, I, I said it. And then next thing you know, she had a gym, she had kids. So I was like, okay, we got to do this. Uh, and then I uh, kind of was missing coaching a little bit. So uh, we, we got some teams together. Uh, so we've been able to put kids in school. Uh, we, just, we just put in our third, third player into college on a full scholarship. Um, and then I, I, I've been coaching other coaches. So right now I currently coach uh, with other universities uh, through a number of different ways. We do some group coaching. I got some one-on-one -on -one clients as well. Uh, but we basically just help people level up uh, on the basketball side. So that's basically what I do. Ooh, so that's, that's, first of all, congrats. And just, I commend all the work that you do. Um, for one, I'm happy that I have a Long Islander in here because the guys who rep this city nonsense all day, uh, there's so much talent that comes out of Long Island, New York. And, you know, I'm going to definitely get a, touch on, you know, uh, your wife, someone that I looked up to growing up for years. Uh, but I wanted to try to circle back to the beginning of um, you speaking about your um, uncle, Coach Thomas Patterson. Um, definitely something that I can relate to because my uncle is who helped me get started in the career that I'm in as far as media, um, just giving me the opportunity at first. Um, and you also had made a, a comment about how you felt like coaching kind of called you. And I definitely want you to speak about that because I think so oftentimes people kind of feel like because they played, the next thing to do is to coach. And I think that coaching is a knack that you really have to have a sense of leadership and know how to handle, you know, athletes. And you have to have a passion for it that it's not just, okay, I'm no longer playing. I want to be around the game. Let me coach. It's really something that you really have to be called to do. So how was that transition from becoming a player then to coach, but then going, it's a two part question, coaching men, then to coaching women. How have those transitions, you know, been for you? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. Uh, so when I first started coaching, like I said, I, I, I personally, I, I actually told somebody I was walking up the back stairwell at the University of Louisville uh, when I was a video coordinator. And at the time, I had loved player development. You know, that was something that I love to do. Uh, I love to help people get better. Like, that's my main thing. And I figure if I'm going to be in basketball, I might as well individually help these players become the best players that they can be. And I had a chance to, to work out some of the best players in the world. You know, we talk about Adrian McCautry, who was a number one pick in the WNBA draft. We talk about Shoni Schimmel, who was a 13 pick. But my best friend, Candace Bingham, she was the, uh, Candace Bingham, uh, well, she just got married, so she got a new last name now. Uh, but she was she also went in the in the second round. So all of these type of players that I was working with 
on the women's side. Um, and one of my uh, colleagues was walking up the back stairwell as well. And she said, she stopped and she asked me, she said, you know, the girls really listen when you speak to them. Have you ever thought about coaching? And I kind of laughed at her. I was like, yo, man, as yo, soon as you become a coach, players don't listen. Like, I don't know what it is, but like when you say you a coach, it's almost like being a parent. Like they don't want to listen to their parents. Um, so I was kind of like, I'm not really trying to do that. Uh, but it just kind of called me and it put me in a, it put me in a great position um, to become a coach when that call came. Uh, but I never really had wanted to do it. Um, but just being a leader in the aspect of always wanting to be the best in my craft. Like, I think that that's one thing that I've always been very, very intentional about. Uh, whatever I'm in, I'm going to try to be the best at it. You know, whether it's me being a husband, whether it's me being a teacher, whether it's me being a business owner, I'm going to give it everything that I have on every single play. So that's what made coaching, uh, going from playing to coaching a little bit easier in the transition, because I've always been a player. I had to work for everything. As you can see, I'm a smaller player. Uh, I had to fight for all, every single bucket I got, I had to fight for. <laughs> I feel like I'm on uh, five heartbeats when he was like, every night I got to fight to prove my love. <laughs> um, but I was fighting for every single bucket that I got. Um, so it, it made it a little bit easier for me because I, I developed that inner drive and that inner um, development. So I was, I was very, very hands-on with player development because I know what it feels like. So I can speak directly to your game. So like I, I coach my kids totally different. I, I ask you like, hey, what's, the, what's your favorite way to score? And I want you to tell me because if you say, hey, I like to shoot from the wing, I'm going to give you a couple moves to help you get that shot off from the wing. And then I'm also going to help with your weaknesses. So, you know, those are things that I've been able to do as a coach that went straight hand in hand with me being able to, uh, to play the game. Um, and then the, the next part of your question uh, with my uncle, you know, my uncle was a huge part of my life, still is today, uh, because he not only taught me about the game, he taught me about a work ethic. Uh, you know, he, he, we used to go to the park, we would play, and we would play uh, three on three with no dribbles. You get no dribbles, you get one dribble, you, get, you would have to pass and screen away. Uh, so I became fundamentally sound. So when I teach my kids, I always start with the basics. I always start with the fundamentals. And I never get too far away from that because I know that everybody needs fundamentals. Even in our coaching course, we talk about the coaching fundamentals. And what are you willing to do every single day as a coach to get to where you want to go in your career? How, uh, how, how important is player development with younger uh, players? Mm, man, um, to me, player development is a, is a huge part of your game. Like, especially when you talk about a younger player, I feel like you should start with player development. It's almost like, it's almost like personal development with your career. How much could you actually think that you're going to get accomplished at your job or with your career if you don't individually work on your skill set? You know what I'm saying? So I think that player development is a great place to start, but you also need that competitive edge. You also need to be able to build the winning edge. And that's one thing that we teach with all the kids that we train, all our student athletes, even the pros that I train, I always teach that, yo, you got a competitive nature in your head naturally. Like it's a gift that God gave us. So you should instantly be thinking, how can I do more? How can I expand my game? How can I become better? So I feel like player development is an essential when you're talking about getting better as a student athlete. Absolutely. Now, Coach Paul, I got a question for you. You mentioned earlier the mindset of the young athlete when they hear the word coach, uh, where they almost want to tune you out like a parent. Talk about the challenges of keeping the young athlete motivated through practice and through the grinds <laughs> of a season. Oh, man, what an uh, excellent question. Y'all hitting me with some fire questions, man. Thank God. You know what I'm saying? I'm working on my craft. I'm getting better as I go, right? <laughs> We uh, thought about this. You can tell. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. I love it. Um, so one thing that we pride ourselves in with our training uh, with Trust the Grind, we love to, to work on the athlete's mindset. It's actually a course that we teach. Uh, inside of that course, we teach you what it looks like to be coachable. We teach you what it looks like to, to, to have that motivation. But I come from more of an internal standpoint because I love to um, – I love to coach from the jungle, all right? So let me break down the jungle to you, right? So we use an assessment with everybody that we work with, even with my coaches, I teach them how to use this assessment as well. In the assessment, you got four animals. You have the lion who's driven by results. This is the, this is the player that's very aggressive. They are gonna take the last shot, whether you tell them to or not. Like that's just, they just, I'm just keeping it real, that's the lion. 
Then you have the, uh, the Flamingo. This is the flamboyant, energetic, inspiring. Uh, I'm a 99% Flamingo, if you can't tell. Uh, then you have the Chameleon. The Chameleon is very stable, status quo. Uh, that's the person that's always uh, just a, a, a natural team player. Uh, then you have the Turtle. The Turtle is all about details, all about making sure uh, that things are, are, are detail orientated, they're crossing the T's, dotting the I's. So first thing you gotta do is identify what type of player you're actually dealing with. So I always go with KYP, know your personnel. So I'm looking to see, okay, what type of player is this? What type of kid am I dealing with? What type of athlete is this? What's their mindset? Are they a faster paced person? And now I would already know I'm either dealing with a flamingo or a lion. If it's a slower paced person, I'm dealing with a turtle, or I'm dealing with a chameleon. And now I tailor fit my leadership language to reach that person right where they are. I don't like to coach from a, 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 a up in the box. You know what I'm saying? I don't like to look down and try to coach on you and tell you all the stuff you're doing wrong. I like to get in the game with you and meet you right where you are and say, hey, you know what? You did make a mistake in the game, but you're getting better because you're learning the concepts. You're learning what you should and shouldn't be doing. Now we need to go in and watch film together and see exactly where you need to utilize the things that we've been talking about. So I, I like to use a standpoint from, um, from coaching in the jungle when it comes to motivating our student athletes and teaching them about the athlete's mindset. That is the best answer I have ever. <laughs> I love the fact that you don't have a uniform way of coaching. Like the fact that you kind of characterize each player to have their own individual, you know, skill set is something that a lot of coaches will kind of have this uniform blanket when everyone learns differently. You know, some people are visual learners, some people have to write it down. So that's kind of how you have to treat them in regards to their style of play. Um, one thing that I always notice is your Instagram, your motivational videos. I know I always try to repost them and just kind of look for them for encouragement. Um, I've seen one of your videos, you were speaking a lot about how much you live your life by principle and how you compare um, like kind of life lessons when you're speaking to your girls, even on the sideline. Like guys, he had a clip that it was, it probably was like a 10 second little timeout, but he managed to pull in like a life comparison to right there in the moment in the game. What is one of your favorite principles or just your favorite kind of life lessons that you compare basketball with to your, your uh, players? Yeah, um, you know, a huge part of my uh, coaching philosophy and my coaching makeup comes from the Bible. Um, so I'm very driven uh, by, the, by the spirit and I come straight out of the Bible. So I teach a lot of things from the Bible. I just don't tell the kids that it's scripture. <laughs> uh, so I guess you could say I got the cheat code. <laughs> uh, but um, one of my principles that I love to give my kids is, you know, give, give every play everything you have um, and make sure that you're practicing loyalty and faithfulness. Um, you know, that's one thing that I, I love to teach with the coaches that I coach, as well as with my players, uh, is making sure that you give everything you have to each play. Uh, I remember when I was coaching at the University of Marshall, uh, and we, we had basically, you know, every coaching staff should have something that they, that they stand for, you know, some core values, different things that are some coaching mantras. And one of our mantras was attitude and effort. And I loved it. However, it didn't really explain what type of attitude and what type of effort. So uh, I kind of switched it up and I said, we give 100% effort and we always have a positive attitude. So those are two things like you would see with every kid that I coach and I have a part with developing as a student athlete, I'm always telling them, yo, one thing that you can control is your, your attitude. Like you can make sure, I don't care if the ball goes in 100% of the times or 10% of the time, you can have a positive attitude and it don't have to be soft. That don't mean that you soft just because you feel like the next play is going to be better than your last play. It actually means that you're looking and you're assessing, you're self-aware of where you need to get better at and what you need to work on. So I always tell them, make sure you have 100% effort. And it looks different. And that's something I teach my coaches. 100% effort for me in a workout, like, like, yo, my wife, my wife will work out hard hardcore like she a workout like right now she uh, she on a hundred with her workouts i'm not there my hundred percent effort in a workout it, it, it's not gonna match up to hers the trainer asked me today on the on the zoom training session he said oh we gonna do a competition how many can you get and how many can she get and we got done i was so tired i said i couldn't even keep count she was like 25 i'm like i lost because i don't even know how many i had 
but that's what my effort looks like. So I always tell my, my, my student athletes and my coaches, like everybody's hundred percent effort is going to look different. So you got to be able to dip and dodge out of your different animals in your assessment to be able to reach that kid where they are. Right. And it's, it's funny that you said you had a cheat code. So you have two cheat codes. Okay. One, the Bible as your principles, but also um, I know the guys heard me mention earlier that his wife, Gabby, was one of my role models. And I know this is the Coach DP show right now, but you already brought her up, so I'm going to continue talking about her real quick. Um, but Gabby Gibson, you know, before obviously before she was uh, Paul, um, won the New York State Championship in high school. So she was one of the one young ladies that when I was in high school, I used to take the train to go over and see the Colpet girls play basketball. And um, they were just a phenomenal group of girls. So you definitely have a cheat code that you have a wife that is a phenomenal athlete to kind of help you, I guess, kind of mentor and coach women. Because I always say it takes coaching women, not to say it's so different, but, you know, you have to be cognizant of, uh, I don't want to say we're super emotional because I don't even want to say that. Like, we're just, we're just as tough as guys. But you have to know how to coach women, though. Like, that is a, that is a different skill set, I think, than coaching men. Um, and cause you don't want to baby them, but you'd also want to be, you know what I mean? You have to have that balance of coaching women Let versus me men. Sorry. Sit again. I want to tell you a story about when I first started coaching women. Um, so when I first started coaching women, uh, matter of fact, I was, a, I was an assistant coach at Marshall at the time. Um, and I was making sure, you know, I was trying to reach my kids. I was trying to get them to, to step outside the box and do some different type of things. Now, we was trying to turn around a program. So obviously, that's a little bit of a different style of coaching. Uh, so we were trying to get them to all come together on one page. Um, so I was giving a lot of direction to the girls, like what they should be doing, what they should be working on and stuff. But I, I quickly realized that they don't care nothing about no strategy until they know that you care about them. Uh, so that's one thing that I always make sure when it comes to females and I'm coaching uh, my student athletes that happen to be girls. Uh, first of all, I, I, I say, I tell them first, you're a basketball player. Like let's, let's keep it 100. Like you a basketball player. So I'm coaching basketball players and I know how to meet you where you are. So I got to walk up to you first and ask you, yo, how you doing? Is everything okay today? Like I like to feel the temperature. I want to make sure, like, yo, is everything all right? I even go, I'll go deep enough with my girls today, and I'll say, hey, are, are, are we good? Like, are you, are you having a good day today? Can we go <laughs> first? Can, we, can I meet you there today? I got to really make sure, like, hey, you good? And they'll be like, okay, cool. But after you do that so many times with them, um, they loosen up. And having my wife has been, like, like just like you said, that's another <laughs> cheat code because yeah. at the end of the day I can always call a 2,000 point scorer <laughs> before I go to bed I can lay down next to my 2,000 point scorer and ask her hey how would you feel if a coach asked you this or or responded this type of way uh, and don't get it twisted I, I've been using my wife in that regard since the first day I met her I've been helping she's been helping me recruit she's been helping me do everything so yeah, my my wife is always here. If she even if she ain't on on the call, she here. She with me all the time. I, I, I love that. Me. I love that so much. <laughs> I want to go back really quick because you, you know you're talking about um, different coaching styles for different players, but and at the same time trying to get the best out of every player. So, what what do you do when you come across a player with let's say uh, the the Randy Moss type of attitude um, where you know, I play when I want to play. Someone who knows that they all world talent, but they, but you know, it's, it's all about them. What do you say to that player? That's a great question. That is a great question. Um, so my main, I'm real big on showing kids exactly where they want to go. So I like to know what do you want to do. So my main thing. So let's say you know I I am dealing with a student athlete that thinks that you know, hey, I got the skill set. I have the 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 uh, talent to get to the next level. I ask them, what level do you want to play at? And if the kid said they want to be a pro, I get a pro on the phone. I call a pro and be like, hey, uh, could you tell them what you was doing when you was in ninth grade and what you was working on and what type of attitudes you had? And I let them talk to the pro. So now it makes me, now I have automatically became the guru. So kids don't want to listen to you until they know that you're the guru. So I make sure my kids understand like, yo, you want to go play D1? I coach D1. 
You want to go to the you want to go to the WNBA? Let me get Angel on the phone for you. Let me get Shoney on the phone for you. So it, it already established the, the the ground. And normally, what happens is coaches don't establish that relationship first, right? You got to build a relationship first, and then you got to be able to show them your body of work. I let my body of work speak for me, so I can connect with that student athlete where they are. So if they are having some issues, and I, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it real with them. I love to use a sandwich approach. I give them a positive. Hey, man, you know, I know you may be going through it right now, but, mm -hmm. you know, you are doing well when it comes to your ball handling or whatever they're doing good. And then I'll mm -hmm. tell them, but you, do, you need to get better with your attitude. Like your attitude is what's really hurting you right now, and that's the detour in your, in your career. Look at these things that have happened, and I, 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 I reverse it back. Look at the teams you've been kicked off. Look at this. And I'm not telling you you're going to get kicked off. But what I want you to know is we want you here. And we need you here. And we need the best that you got. So I'm going to need you to come out and play. Now, I think Coach, um, because you're so hands-on and you, you're making this conscious effort to connect with the student athlete and the basketball player, how do you feel AAU has affected uh, the, the culture of youth basketball? Yeah. Um, you know, we have tons of AAU teams. Um, so I know that from a basketball standpoint, it's kind of been um, a situation where you, you're you almost um, frowned upon if you don't play AAU. So uh, I understand that, but I also understand that you don't have to be the best AAU player in order to get a scholarship. Uh, so I, I tell my kids all the time, it's about what you put out there. You know what I'm saying? Like the scouts are going to come and find you. People are going to talk about you. But what you put out there, you can never take back. So I don't care if you're playing AAU, you're playing high school, you're playing pickup. When you step on the court, you need to show it everything that you got because you don't know who's watching. Uh, but when it comes to AAU, I think the kids are playing way too many games, first of all. Uh, you got no legs, right? And, and then sometimes it's just bad basketball. Whether it's AAU, high school, middle school, whatever it is, it's just a lot of bad basketball going on right now. And when I say bad basketball, I just mean – they're not being taught the fundamentals, right? You shouldn't get to the age of 16 and you got no counter moves. How you can't cross over and get to the basket? Somebody cuts off your right hand, you can't do nothing? That, that's unacceptable. But that's got to fall back on your leadership. Like, like my kids already understand, like, you should be working on your game. Yeah. If you don't work on your game, you're not going to play. And I tell the parents, I love for parents to come watch my practice. Watch the practice. Sit close because I'm going to talk loud so you can hear everything that's going on. And you, you don't have to wonder why your kid ain't getting in the game. You don't have to try to figure it out. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on. And these are the things that they need to do in order to increase their playing time if they want to get better. So I feel like AAU is um, – you know, it's some positives as well as some negatives, but I also feel like it's about the individual that is playing. If you're playing to get on the circuit and get your name out there and, uh, and make sure that people know who you are, then it is what it is. But it's way too many games. It's stress on your body. Sometimes those, uh, the gyms are not even sanctioned gyms, meaning they don't even have the right criteria. It's not the right footage. It's not the right space, which hurts your game. Like if you playing on the court, this mad small all the time. You get to college, you playing on 90, 94 feet, baby. You out of shape. You ain't never played on the full court. So, you know, those type of things have a lot to do with your development as a player. I think that's an excellent point because I remember for myself, I was on about, I remember there was one summer, I was probably on like three AAU teams. And we had so many games. And I remember AAU being fun, but when I, in retrospect, I think it was fun because it kind of reminded me of street ball. Because there was some tournaments where the refs weren't, it wasn't, you played all day and they weren't calling certain things. You didn't have that time to, yes, you need game experience, but you also need that fundamental drill time. And the practices with AAU weren't that often. It was like AAU is pretty much just you play games. Um, so, you know, I completely agree. I think it kind of hurts the fundamentals. Whereas when the full season came around, it was kind of like, oh, wait, this is, the line is there and we can't, you know, that's a trap. Like all those things got affected. Um, what is um, a piece of advice that you would love to give to a brand new coach that, um, you know, maybe doesn't have the experience that you've had or trained the caliber of players that you've had? Um, what's a piece of advice that you would give to them? 
if if I was speaking to uh, a younger coach that maybe doesn't have much coaching experience, right? Um, the piece of advice I would give them right away is go to work. Like, uh, you know, I, I talk to tons of coaches that have an idea of what they want to do and they think about how they would like to coach so much that they forget to go coach. You have to go get it. You have to involve yourself in the process. You got to you got to get out of yourself and go help someone else. So it's not about what you know and what you can do. It's about who can you help and how can you help them get to where they want to go. So I would say go pick a kid. Literally, just go, if a kid is standing in the middle of the street dribbling the basketball, go pick them and say, hey, yo, let me help your game. That's how I started coaching. I literally was, I was sitting on the bus coming back from a game. We was playing Tuskegee. And that, that bus ride is thir 13 hours to get back to Kentucky. So I had a lot of time to think on that ride. And uh, one of my, my close friends that was playing on the team, he said, he said, yo, DP, what do you think I need to do? And I said, man, everybody's sitting on your right side. You can, you, you, every time you get the ball, they're forcing you to go left. You got to at least jab and, and make them think you're going to go that way. And I can show you some stuff. And he said, yo, can you get me get in the gym with me? And I said, sure. That's how I started coaching. That's how I started. I really started getting into play and development is from being emerged in the process of becoming better. You cannot just go to where you want to be in life. You have to work your way to get there. It's not about the title. It's not about you being called a coach. It's about you helping somebody else to improve their life and get the, the dreams and the results that they would like. All right, Coach DP, this is good stuff. You, I hope, I hope you plan on writing a book of coaching after this because this is, this is crazy. I've had a lot of coaches in my life and the things that you're saying is stuff that I haven't even heard before. Um, where can we find, you know, just your services? You know, you spoke about your wife and what you guys do as a family. Um, for any girls that are in Long Island or girls that are in New York City, um, whether it's online or in person, where can we find you and, and you know, have your services? Definitely. Um, so our basketball training business is G3G Basketball Training. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you go to G3Gathletictraining.com, you can actually uh, look at our website. You can book a session. Uh, we do virtual sessions right now, obviously, because of the times that we're in. Uh, we also do, we have a uh, athlete's mindset. Uh, that is a online course where we teach our student athletes uh, through some um, video tutorials about how to become better on the mental side of basketball, increasing your basketball IQ, because a lot of kids just don't know the game. Uh, and it's nobody's fault. It's just they don't know the game. And then you got coaches. They don't know the game. So, um, so you know, we teach that as well. Uh, and then on the personal side, if you go to my uh, Facebook, Devin Paul, my Facebook, I do a lot of coaching for my other coaches from there. And you can also visit my personal website at DevonTPaul.com. How, um, how important is the mental aspect of it uh, from the coaching standpoint, dealing with your players? Oh, from a coaching standpoint, it's just as important as it is from a player standpoint. Um, you know, sometimes as coaches, we could get caught up in what we're telling the student athletes, but we rarely listen to what we're, we're saying as a coach. Uh, so I, I, I always make sure that I work with my coaches on the mental side. I pretty much only coach in the background with my other coaches on the mental side. For example, if a coach comes to me and says they have a problem connecting with a student athlete, I don't say things like, hey, take them to the court, do X, Y, and Z. I, I call plays, but my plays are different. I'll say, hey, this relationship is like a piggy bank, right? So I want you to think about a, a piggy bank that you put coins in. When you little, you drop the little coins in the piggy bank. So if you want your relationships to get better as a whole, you drop coins in there. Coach, what are coins? You want to connect first. You want to connect with that student athlete one-on-one. -on -one. You want that to overlap or overflow into something that they enjoy doing. For example, if I'm dealing with a kid that loves to go out to McDonald's, I'm not going to try to connect with her in the gym. That's not the best place for me to, I'm gonna go to McDonald's. I'm gonna go straight into her stomping grounds, right? Now, now I have already shown you that I'm making an investment, right? I'm investing in you and our relationship. Now I'm going to nurture that relationship and tell you like, hey, 
let's try this again next next week. Let's let's link up again. Let's 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 connect again next week. Now I'm gonna run that play over and over. Now I'm organically building my relationships as I run these different plays. So I teach my my coaches from a basketball standpoint, just like I'm telling my kids, you need to have an athlete's mindset. I'm teaching my coaches to have a coach's mindset when it comes to what you're supposed to be thinking about and the different things that you're supposed to be doing. I even teach them, you know, if you're teaching a student athlete, if, if you're dribbling with the right hand and the defense cuts you off, second nature is make a change of direction move, whether it's a crossover, behind the back, spin move, whatever you want to do, but you got to change directions. I tell my coaches, if you're dealing with a kid and you're not getting through on one side, change directions. Why you keep trying to go the same way? Why you keep trying to tell them the same thing over and over? That's your fault. If you keep saying the same thing over and over and getting the same response, you need to change up your method. And that's why I teach the, the animals, because you got four different methods that you can use. Don't get caught up on just one. Recently, this April, the NCAA um, have made more steps towards allowing student athletes to get paid for likeness and for endorsements. What are your kind of your thoughts of that? It's an open debate that we've had on our show here for quite a while. Um, does that kind of change the attitude of the players? How do you determine pay? Um, but, you know, you working hand in hand with, with players, how do you feel about, about getting paid for, you know, their likeness? Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, I think that uh, the NCAA is making a fortune. Uh, I'm going to just keep it 100. I think that they are doing very well on the business side when it comes to an income and a revenue. So I am a businessman overall. So in business, if you're making a ton of money on your revenue and you're not paying the employees, obviously you're going to come out on the higher side. So I think that business-wise, it should be done. Now, when it comes to the ins, ins and outs, it's going to be very difficult to decide, does the top player get the same amount as the last player on the bench? And that's been the main conflict between the NCAA when it comes to paying the athletes. How do you pay each athlete? So I do think that that is something that can be worked through. But I do think that it, it is a business. And coaches always tell players, let's keep it real. Coaches tell players in college, this is a business. Like, like you need to get your life together. This is a business. So if it is a business, they should be paid. I, I just feel like that's just that's a no brainer. Like it should they should be able to profit off of their hard work. Uh, now I don't think that it should be a huge profit, uh, but I do think that that's pretty rough if you're dropping twenty five points a night and you come home and you got nothing to eat and you can't afford to go get a pizza. I agree. Really, really quick because I know we got to get out of here soon. You, you you spoke earlier about the four different animals, and I would I would assume uh, the lion would be a, a MJ or a Kobe, right? But could you give us an example of those other three animals as far? It could be NBA players or WNBA players, but just kind of break that down for somebody at home that might not know what kind of a player is, is what animal. Yeah, definitely. So so I would say first of all, I think MJ is definitely a lion, uh, super aggressive, uh, all about getting the job done. Uh, when it comes to the chameleon, I would say definitely Scottie Pippen. Uh, would be more of a chameleon style player uh, when it comes to, uh, only because he is all about, you know, making sure things get accomplished. If you remember on the last dance, Scotty, uh, there was a clip where uh, uh, Phil Jackson drew up a play and the shot was going to Kukoc, coach, but Scotty he went off in that game. So he got into his feelings, which chameleons are very emotional. So he showed, he went into that chameleon uh, status when it came down to it and he went and he sat on the bench. So you got to be very aware with the chameleons because they will get super emotional on you. So Scottie Pippen, I would say he is a chameleon. Uh, when it comes to a uh, flamingo, I would say that's more of a uh, flamboyant player, you know, maybe a James Harden. I would say he's probably a flamingo building his own brand, doing his own thing. Uh, he's all about, you know, being in the limelight, but he may not win a, a, a chip though, but he's, he's going to definitely get his. Uh, then when you look at the turtle, you know, the turtle, I would say is like a slower pace. This would be more of your point guard and more of your Chris Paul, uh, making sure everybody else is kind of making sure they're doing what they need to be doing, but also being able to see the court, uh, with that court vision, uh, that would normally be a slower pace person. I would even say more of a John Stockton back in, uh, back in the day when you think about players like that. Uh, coach, one last question for you. Um, because of your, your insight and knowledge of the women's game, and there was a lot made over the last few years of the wage gap between the men's and the women's game, what 
do you think needs to change uh, so that the women are getting paid on an equal scale? And what can be done to improve the visibility of the WNBA game? Oh, um, man, I was just- Excellent question. <laughs> I was just talking to my wife about this. Um, the first thing I think is they have to kind of, I think they should make it more of like their own league. Uh, right now, as it being the WNBA, I feel like it, it's kind of always going to be the shadow of the NBA. Uh, and it kind of makes it like a second option. Like, oh, like the NBA is not on, watch the WNBA. But I think that it should be more of a like, this is the women's league. Uh, and then I also feel like, uh, you know, the arenas that they play in. Like, there's no reason a women's team should be playing in Madison Square Garden. Like, you know, when they were playing there, like I, I, I went to a game. So I went to a game at um, Columbia University. The Liberty were playing in the, um, it was like a preseason type exhibition game. And, and the environment was great. The, the atmosphere was great. Like I feel like those more closed in arenas would bring that type of feel to the game and making it more like it's, like, like it's a great time for your family to come enjoy this game and kind of building a niche. I think they need to find a real niche for women's basketball and promote it as if it is a real business instead of just putting them in random cities that NBA teams are in or they feel like they may be in. Um, I think that that's, that's what probably needs to be the biggest change. Uh, but I do believe that they, they should definitely be getting paid uh, at least similar wages. There's no reason, there's no incentive for women to play, for women to play. Like, I just go overseas. Like all of my girls are like, yo, I play overseas. That's where I make a majority of my money. And I come back for the endorsement deals. That's just the way that it goes. I think that's a great point. Cause I think they do, they have always treated the WNBA almost like the second, like the second stepchild of the NBA. Like it's always like the second hand and comparing it to that is going to just have a still you know, trying to compete with the NBA rather than being our own entity. So that's something I never thought about it in that regard. Um, but thank you so much for just, I really enjoyed this. This was extremely informative. Um, I love all the work that you do for our, our female athletes and our athletes in general. Um, just give the people all of your social media handles and just once again, where they can find you. Definitely. Like I said, first of all, I'm thankful uh, for you, for everybody bringing me on. Anybody that's listening, I'm thankful for that. Uh, my Instagram is uh, Devrin Paul. Um, uh, it's Devrin, let me make sure. D-E-V-R-I-N-N -N -N <laughs> underscore Paul, P-A-U-L. Um, and then my, basically all my handles are Devrin Paul. So if you put my name in, you're going to see a lot of my handles. My LinkedIn is the same thing. Uh, and my my uh, Facebook is the same thing, as well as my um, my YouTube. So definitely follow my YouTube channel. I put up new videos every Friday. We also do coaching corner interviews where we interview current coaches. Uh, we just had an athletic director on last week. We had the associate head coach from University of Louisville on last week. Uh, so we have coaches that come on and share their story and give different knowledge to coaches that are on the call. Um, so those are all my handles. And like I said, I'm thankful. Uh, and I just want to leave everybody that's listening with one piece of encouragement one piece of uh, knowledge to help you to get through your week. Uh, make sure when you're looking at the areas in your life and you're trying to get better and level up and you're trying to close the gap, make sure that you're not making excuses, but you're making the adjustments, right? I'm gonna say that again. Make sure you're not making no excuses, but you're making the proper adjustments. So when you go through your week today, no excuses, only adjustments. Yo. First off, when we get back in the studio, I need you to come back because his energy is amazing. Thank you That's so much. Flamingo! <laughs> <laughs> Coach, we definitely appreciate you, man. You dropped a lot of gems on us today. I'm yes. thankful to be here, man. Anytime y'all want me to come back, just hit me up. Yeah, I, yeah, think I got we, you. I think what we should do is uh, once things, you know, slow down with the coronavirus and you can actually get back to full steam with your doing, I would love for us to come out see you there working um with, with with the young ladies and then from there we then we'll set it up to come back into the station right from there no doubt yeah, we, we can definitely cover you know whatever event you have and do some video work and just some interviews and and just keep it going we definitely support you and i'm looking forward to see that you know how your career blossoms and i support i support you guys too so it's the feeling is mutual <laughs>
Thank you so much. Be uh, safe. Thank you. Same to you. Y'all have a good night. And that's a wrap, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Real Fans, Real Talk, Quarantine Edition. I'm your girl, Emerald Marie. We have Legends in Two Games and Trip Young. Peace. Real fans, real talk, we is real.